the test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a clerk at the inquiry's desk of a transport company and a man who is asking for travel information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Travelink. How can I help you? Good morning. I live in Bayswater and I'd like to get to Harbour City tomorrow before 11am. Well, to get to Bayswater... No, no, I live in Bayswater. My destination is Harbour City. Oh, sorry. Right, so that's Bayswater to Harbour City. Are you planning to travel by bus or train? I don't mind, really. Whichever option is faster, I suppose. Well, if you catch a railway express, that'll get you there in under an hour. Let's see. Yes, if you can make the 9.30am express, I'd recommend you do that. Great. Which station does that leave from? Hellendale is the nearest train station to you. Did you say Helensvale? No, Hellendale. That's H-E-L-E-N-D-A-L-E. What's the best way to get to the Hellendale station, then? Well, hang on a minute while I look into that. Now, it seems to me that you have two options. Option one would be to take the 706 bus from the Bayswater Shopping Centre to Central Street. When you get there, you transfer to another bus which will take you to the station. Or the second option, if you don't mind walking a couple of kilometres, is to go directly to Central Street and get straight on the bus going to the train station. OK. Which bus is that? The 792 will take you to the station. I guess the walk will be good for me, so that might be the better option. What time do I catch the 792? There are two buses that should get you to the station on time. One just before 9 o'clock and one just after. But, look, at that time of the morning it might be better to take the earlier one, just in case there's a traffic jam or something. The 855 is probably safer than the 905. Yeah, I don't want to miss the train, so I'll be sure to get on the 5 to 9 bus. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. By the way, how much will I have to pay in fares? Well, you can get a ticket on the bus for $1.80 cash and you'll need $10 each way for the train. Wait, do you have a travel link card? No, but I can get one before tomorrow. OK, well that'll make it considerably cheaper then. The bus will cost $1.50 each way and the train will be... The train to Harbour City will still cost $10 because you'll be travelling during peak hours in the morning. So no savings there, I'm afraid. However, if you could come back at an off-peak time... What does that mean? Well, if you could start your return journey before 5pm or later than half past seven in the evening... Actually, I wasn't planning on coming back till at least eight o'clock anyway. Oh, in that case, you can make quite a saving if you use your travel link card. You did say you were planning to purchase one, didn't you? Yes, I'll pick one up later today. Good. That would mean your return train journey would only cost you $7.15 with your card. Thank you. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, there is. Do you know if I can use the travel link card on ferries? If you're thinking of the Harbour City ferries that go back and forth between the North and South Bank, those are the commuter ferries, then yes. A one-way trip costs $4.50, but with your card you'd make a 20% saving and only pay $3.55. So $3.55 for the commuter ferry. What about the tour boats? 
You mean the tourist ferries that go upriver on sightseeing tours? No, they only take cash or credit card. They're not part of the Travelink company. Oh, I see. I don't suppose you know the cost of a tour. In actual fact, I do, because I took a friend on the trip upriver just last week. We decided on the afternoon tour, and that was thirty-five dollars each. But I understand that you can do the whole day for sixty-five dollars. Thank you. You've been a great help. My pleasure. Enjoy your day out. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to sixteen. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up ten years ago by myself, John, and my then girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby. We felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers, we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the national park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So. Five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full time on Barker's Country Safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. 
Now, often this is sold out and we have all of our 10 Jeeps and convoy with eight people in each Jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here so they come back for the bigger tours. Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8 a.m. and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And then evening ones, 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. All the tours follow the same route and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the Family Exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually it is just one Jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal. Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student called Mary and her tutor, Mr. Hadstone. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Mr. Headstone. Is this the right time for our meeting? Yes, it is. Thanks for coming in at such a late hour, Mary. I know you've had a busy day studying and will be keen to get home. And thanks for volunteering to run this project. It's going to help you develop and practice skills needed by teachers today. Field trips are getting more and more a part of school life. So as a student of education, it'll be wonderful training for you. It's really a great opportunity. We did loads of field trips at school, so I've got a good idea of what sort of things we could do. Hmm, I expect so. But we're here to go through the basics of planning one, and the trip leader carries a load of responsibility. Right now, you're focusing on activities, but your main job is to consider the dangers and come up with ways of countering or avoiding them. There are lots of government regulations you won't have been aware of on your school trips, but they're just a guideline for your own planning. Some of those school trips you went on would have been pretty adventurous, right? Yeah. Okay, and your plan needs to be tailored to the kind of trip you're doing. On a well-planned and successfully led adventure trip, we don't often hear problems, even though sometimes there's bad weather, for example, that a, that a school party has managed to combat. That's because the leader created a well-thought-out hazard management plan. Ah! Oh, I thought I'd just be taking my mates out on a trick. Now it's all paperwork. Yes, well, that's why I called you in. We'll work on this together over the next few days. I just wanted to give you a heads-up on what you'll need to think about. 
there are some aspects that every trip needs to consider. What do you think they might be? Uh, well, heavy rain or high winds, I guess, and any dangers in the terrain? Yes, we call those the significant factors. And another important one is the makeup of your group. But you don't need to go overboard. There are some kinds of hazard that you won't need to think about at all. Things like hurricanes, earthquakes, radioactivity, or major diseases such as cancer. The official name for those is unlikely events, because they almost certainly won't happen. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Okay, so let's consider the hazards seen as most likely on a field trip into the countryside. Weather causes real problems. Overexposure to the sun or the cold, even the wind, can have a big impact. And, of course, the weather can change very suddenly and without warning. Yes. People can get into trouble in the hills if they don't bring extra layers of clothes and a jacket, even if they start walking on a hot day. Oh, and a raincoat too, of course. Um, what's next then? Well, let's think about possible activities and what you might need. Yes, OK. Well, for hiking, of course, we need a first aid kit. Oh, and a decent topographic map of the area. And we need to make sure that more than one person can read it. I've run into lots of difficulties in the past with people who can't identify even major features, like rivers. And some people have no idea about contour lines. Ah, uh, and I suppose a compass, too. You'd need to list those. Then there are things that might be obvious, but must be written down and considered seriously. For example... If there's a possibility of falling more than two and a half meters, that's considered life-threatening. And I'm sure you would be aware of problems near the sea, like tides or high waves. And the trouble you can get into where there's a possibility of an avalanche or a mudslide or a flash flood if you're anywhere near rivers. Yes. Well, I was thinking of an adventurous route for this trip. You know, that's always more fun. And it's such a cool feeling when you've achieved something really difficult. Yes, okay, but then you need to consider who's going to be in your party. Don't go and plan things that are beyond the reach of most people or you're asking for trouble. You need to take into account the physical strength and experience of the party as a whole. When you make your groups, make sure there's at least one person in each one who's been hiking a few times before. Wow! There's a lot to write down, isn't there? I'm really keen to get started now. Well, good, because there's a lot more detail to consider. For now, I'll just mention two more of the common hazards for high school trips in particular. Yes. The Ministry of Education website says don't use inexperienced volunteers and don't allow student drivers to bring their own cars or to drive anyone else's car, for that matter. Well... Now I really have something to think about. Thanks, Mr. Headstone. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about English language. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 31 to 37.
Those of you who were here last week will remember that we talked about the journey of the English language from its early Indo-European origins through to Old English, Middle English, and then to early and late Modern English, before it reached the form that it has today. Today, we will be continuing that theme by focusing on the future of the English language, and all the places it might go from here. There are about 2.1 billion people around the world who can speak English. Out of these, only 400 million are native speakers, which means that four in five English speakers are non-natives. This is obviously quite an impressive number, considering that just two centuries ago, in 1801, there were only about 20 million speakers of English around the world, and languages like French and German were ahead of English in terms of how many people were using them. But what does it mean? What it means is that the future of the English language doesn't really depend on its native speakers, but on that massive number of non-native speakers learning it around the world. Has everyone... Has anyone heard the term pidgin before, or creole? A pidgin is a simplified version of a language which acts as a bridge between two people who don't have a common language, allowing them to communicate with each other while a creole is a language that evolves from a pidgin, with the difference that it is fully formed with clear grammatical rules and vocabulary. There are currently dozens of pidgin and creole languages based on English around the world, for example, Nigerian pidgin or Jamaican patois. These languages are also known as Englishes. What's interesting about these Englishes is how different they sound to, for lack of a better term, proper English. Take the word trousers, for instance. In Sheng, which is a Kenyan Creole language, they're called longi because they're long. But even versions of English that are recognized as official variations or dialects still differ greatly from each other. Americans and Jamaicans would call the back of a car where you store your luggage the trunk. Britons, Australians, Canadians, and other Commonwealth countries would call it the boot. A subway in the UK is a tunnel under a road that allows pedestrians to cross safely. In the US, it's an underground train. You might think of these differences as minute, but when you take into account the dozens of different versions of English out there, a very intriguing parallel arises with another language from the past. Latin. Latin, too, used to be a lingua franca. Nowadays, it's all but dead, spoken only by a few clerics and scholars. At some point in history, it splintered into various different languages which became known as Romance languages. For example, Spanish, Italian, or French. There are some that theorize that the same thing might happen to English in the near or distant future, that all these Englishes we have today in different countries will continue to develop, so pigeons will turn into Creole languages, and Creole languages will turn into just languages, and English itself, as we know it today, will disappear or become less and less important. It's an interesting theory, if nothing else. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 38 to 40. It makes sense that, as English grows in popularity, countries, especially those with a strong sense of identity and tradition, will develop their own versions of the language, marked by the idiosyncrasies of their culture. Just think of the contribution of dialects such as Jamaican or South African English. In the past 50 years alone, they've added about 25,000 words to the English language, most of these related to a local context that wouldn't have existed in English before the spread of colonialism. In terms of numbers, just those are enough for a brand new language. There are some flaws to this theory too, however. While it's true that Latin and English have a lot of similarities in terms of how they developed or have developed throughout history, there is one big difference. We currently live in an era of globalization. Today, you can be in India 
and stream an American film or TV series in seconds. You can be in Nigeria and listen to British music. You can be in Brazil and read a novel from an Australian author. Just a few centuries ago, this was unthinkable. So what's the other way that English could go? According to some experts, there is the possibility that it could maintain its status as the world's global language, but with a few differences. Already today, most conversations in English occur between non-native speakers. While many of these might be fluent, the majority probably only have an intermediate understanding of the language, devoid of the nuances, colloquialisms, and complex collocations that native speakers employ in their interactions. This means that over time, English could turn into some sort of world speak, the official lingua franca for the entire world, but in a simplified form. Some scholars have even started trying to develop that version of English by selecting the most useful words in the English vocabulary for non-native speakers to learn. Robert McCrum has compiled a comprehensive list of 1,500 words, for example, a version of English that he calls globish. And what about traditional native speaker English? It might continue to exist, but lose its popularity, as the previous theory suggests. There are many more theories about the future of the English language, of course. I've only focused on the two main ones, because they clearly demonstrate our uncertainty when it comes to how this beautiful language will develop. English is in a unique, unprecedented position. No other language has achieved the same levels of popularity in human history, especially in terms of non-native speakers. So, as this is clearly uncharted territory, only time will be able to tell us what will happen. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. End of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.